I'm Barbara. I'm a, I'm a researcher and I'm also an activist. Um, last year I was participating in an action of civil disobedience against a potato field trial with genetically modified uh, potatoes. After the action I have been fired from my uh, university, the University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, for publicly defending this action of civil disobedience. comes from and how it is grown. I was grown, I grew up at the, at the countryside and so um, it's then not by coincidence I think that I started studying uh, engineering in life sciences. In the faculty of, uh, of engineering you are trained to look at uh, problems related to agriculture and to resources, natural resources in a very managerial in a very technical way. If we are reflecting on issues of agriculture and food, um, it's very important to see it as part of a, as part of a society and as part of uh, the way we as a society interact with, uh, with the natural environment. After finishing my studies more and more I have been uh, uh, asking critical uh, questions about it and that's how I became active in the movement uh, related to, uh, to food, uh, food sovereignty uh, in agriculture related issues and also in the struggle against uh, genetically modified organisms. Last year when uh, the University of Ghent in cooperation with some other uh, Flemish research institutes uh, they they started up trial with uh, genetically modified potatoes. I was part of an, uh, of an action group. The subject of, of this action, the, the potato, you know, let's remind ourselves that the potato carries a, an awful lot of symbolism down the ages. It's, uh, it's linked, of course, to one of the great symbolic moments of West European colonization of the world. Uh, uh, you know, Christopher Columbus and so on, bringing the potato back to the courts of Europe for the new discovery from, from the United States. Um, uh, that there's an interesting resonance there because we're talking about new forms of colonization. When the Irish potato famine um, occurred in the 1840s, Malthusian economists um, argued very, very strongly that um, that the cause of the famine was simply the potato blight, the disease that um, uh, the GM potato is supposed to, uh, supposed to uh, uh, provide a remedy for. Um, and that became the dominant narrative explaining why so many people died in the Irish potato famine. But actually there's a much more convincing counter-narrative, counter-explanation which um, which shows that it was really British colonialism and the imposition of um, what we would now call neoliberal economics in, in Ireland that was the, the key cause of, um, of so many deaths. And there again you have potato and the blight 160, 170 years ago or already as a very, very politicised issue. The action or the actions consisted mainly in uh in the beginning in asking critical questions about uh, the trial there, why was it there, what was, be, what was being tested, and uh, so interaction with the researchers about it. And uh, it also consisted in an action of civil disobedience, we called it the big potato swap, in which um, activists, they trespassed uh, private property, private in the sense that it was from a public <laughs> research institute, um, they, they confronted police and they 
jumped over fences in order to pull out some GM potatoes and replace them by organic potatoes. At that day I was present uh, uh, at the field and I was commenting to journalists about what the activists were doing and, wh and why they were doing. Uh, I was there as a, as a citizen, it was on a, on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and this, these interviews, they have been widely broadcasted on, on national TV. And some people have uh, informed my employer, the University of Leuven, about me as a researcher. Uh, defending uh, this kind of actions which was considered as an attack against science. So for my public solidarity with the activists, the, the rector of uh, the University of Leuven decided that I could no longer be part of the university and fired me. One of the, of the main arguments of, uh, of the rector to fire me was he said we cannot trust you anymore because you defend violent attacks against uh, science. We are non-violent, don't, don't shoot them. Yeah, but you can't break on the position we do. Yeah, but come on. I think there can be good reasons for if you do that, that you inform the other parts in, at the university that you do it. Because that is a kind of gentleman agreement. So those who are affected, if you disagree with somebody else at the university, then they are informed. But then I think it should be totally allowed. Otherwise it's uh, really a totalitarian system. And I think that academic freedom is a centerpiece of uh, university life. And uh, academics should have the right to express their opinions about uh, issues of concern without any punishment. I don't think this is such a new phenomenon uh, at all. For instance, in the in, uh, era of uh, Senator McCarthy in the United States, people were hounded out of academia for taking part in communist uh, protests, demonstrations, or even just having sympathy with the Communist Party. I would, I would rather, in this whole discussion about violence and destruction, my question then is if we look at it at a broader scale and if we look at the, the, the real violence of the agro-industry on a world scale in, uh, and their contribution in, in hunger, in the destruction of the environment, in making farmers economically dependent from agro-industry, that's for me the real violence, what we are talking about. This whole story uh, of, uh, of uh, being fired from university and at this point I'm also um, in court because there is an um, accusation that I would be part of a criminal gang, in this uh, case a criminal gang of, uh, dis for destruction of potatoes. Obviously it's very impressive on, on you as a person because you're subjected through a lot of techniques of uh, oppression also we have been criminalized a lot uh, but on the other hand I'm, I'm very happy to see all the the types of debate that these uh, issues open like today we see uh, people are openly debating about issues of GM about the role of university uh, in society about the role of civil disobedience in a in a democracy um, so all these types of debates which uh, have been triggered partly by, uh, by the action. Academics are human beings, and as human beings, they are also citizens 
who engage in public life, who engage in uh, issues that affect our society. And uh, sometimes, uh, as uh, citizens, academics express their opinion on, on these issues, and uh, this uh, may create some tension with uh, their role as uh, scientists. It's an old problem, or let's say it's a problem that goes back to the 1960s and 70s when increasing number of academics felt that they had to be socially responsible, do something socially useful. You are a researcher but you're also a citizen. But you should be, of course, be very careful how you, you treat it. But uh, one thing is that you can act as an expert in the public arena and I think you have in one way you are paid by society then you have a duty to talk on the background of your expertise um, but you also can have your own opinion and you can make them explicit and clear then you I think that should be totally legal we should never confuse the two being an academic is trying to push the theoretical frontiers of knowledge and understanding of the world, being a political activist, is being in the street. That is what Barbara and her associates did understand, and that is what the university administration failed to endorse. They argued that the political activism had a direct influence or connectivity with the academic work that Barbara was doing. By doing so, it was the managers of the neoliberal universities that made the connection between theory and practice, not the activists. Being an activist and a researcher is, I think, something which is compatible and even maybe uh, necessary.